Okay. <sighs> yeah, all right, good, good. Okay, good morning, everybody. What a day, huh? Um, let me do my commercial first. Here comes, here comes 23. Um, welcome to Great Decisions 2021, 2022. My name is Penny Jez, and this is Chuck Webb back here. We make great decisions happen once a month, thank you. I've been the director for Great Decisions for five years now. And for those of you who are tuning in for the first time or attending for the first time and are curious about what Great Decisions is, here's a brief intro. It's the Foreign Policy Association's largest and longest discussion group program on world affairs. Our group meets probably about the same time as many other groups across the country. And we usually meet in person or unfortunately the past year and a half by Zoom in the Commons on the fourth Tuesday of the month from 10 to noon. When we are able to have outside guests, we treat them to lunch in the private dining room and 11 of us are able to have further time with the speaker and we will allow him to have a few bites in between questions. Um, the top eight timely challenges to the United States foreign policy are discussed one at a time throughout the year using the Foreign Policy Association's briefing book. Does anybody have a book? Wave it in the air. I have one left. So if any of you do have people who are interested, let me know. I'll be very happy to get that to them. Um, what's interesting about this this year is they have added a ninth section on changing demographics and how the world population shifts is going to impact what's happening around the world. Um, our sessions each month are highlighted by guest speakers who have expertise in the area and it's usually from the greater Richmond met metropolitan area and from area colleges and universities. So this is the eighth year we have conducted great decisions here. Uh, Walt Fadley and his wife did the first set. Mary Corley and Bob Dale did the second. And I think I started with the, the third year on. I hope I got my count numbers right. Um, we are fortunate to have some of the most brilliant people in the area to speak on topics. So that's my commercial. Okay, now on to the real introduction. Um, what an interesting morning to be here, isn't it? Um, we have a speaker who I'm, I'm sure you will pepper with questions. We do have a chapter on Putin's Russia in the book, and the speaker I was finally able to locate can only come on September 27th. I'm gonna do some serious shuffling and see if I can get her here prior to the time she leaves the United States and visits Russia. <laughs> so uh, be, be tuned, be, stay in tune for a change. Um, like you, I was really not enthusiastic about reading the content to this chapter. But boy, by the time I finished it and I had to digest it in bites, um, I understood the role that WikiLeaks has played in international drama, uh, what Five Eyes are, I never knew about that, um, what the fight with F France and Australia and the United States over submarines was about, what the Wolf Warriors were and why they were so dangerous, among other things. So if you recall, our speaker in January, uh, Professor Stephen Long, warned us that we were paying far too much attention to economic competition with China and that we ought to be paying attention to what's happening in Russia. And of course, now we have seen what's happening in Russia. Uh, what else? Uh, finally, I was grateful for Professor Morton's presentation. If you recall, in the previous five, seven years, we have had a DVD with experts Com with competing opinions about what was going on, you know, what our foreign policy should be, what was happening here, what was happening there. Uh, this past year, due to the pandemic and the staff, uh, staffing shortages at the Foreign Policy Association, they have done a master class with Professor Morton. 
I have seen him once before last year doing YouTube presentations at $8 a clip uh, to augment great decisions. But they hired him to do the entire series. And I was just going, you know, well, let's see how good he was going to be. He was wonderful. Uh, he really cuts through. So I want you to look for him cutting through to the content. And he makes some really interesting comparisons and contrasts between Russia and China that will just open your eyes to the events that are occurring um, as we uh, spend the day today. All right, um, we'll view the DVD first, then we'll change um, tactics and introduce the speaker. And then he will take over the presentation for about 30-40 minutes and then questions and answers. I will signal when time's up, when time's up. You know, uh, we usually end promptly at noon, but there may be so many questions, you know, we'll, we'll have to just try to cut it short. Now onto the DVD with Professor Morton. I hope I can do this, thank you. Please shut your cell phones off. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Great Decisions 2022. Today we tackle topic number six, the Quad Alliance. One week ago, we looked at Myanmar and ASEAN, a regional alliance. The Quad Alliance is significantly broader and involves more significant powers. This graph shows us the four countries involved in the Quad Alliance, the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. Three main considerations before we consider U.S. foreign policy options. We first address the issue of the Quad Alliance, exactly what it is and it is intended for. We consider strategic alliances in general and then look at America's pivot towards Asia. We start with the Quad Alliance. Returning to that earlier graph, these four countries forming an alliance with a very clear target which is the People's Republic of China. And as China continuously makes claims to the South China Sea, the role of the Quad Alliance could be enhanced. China's military spending, as you can see from this graph, has escalated dramatically over the course of the past two decades, reaching levels that are almost unparalleled in world politics. Of course, the United States remains the dominant military spending power in the world, many times larger a budget for its defense procurements. We have been warned by our own military that China's progress is stunning and at the same time reflecting upon many of the traditional problems that have caused the United States to lag behind in terms of efficient spending and global force projection, most notably a brutal military bureaucracy. Back to the Quad Alliance, let's look at the United States as it relates to China in terms of power and projection. If we were to note the areas of the Pacific where the United States enjoys a clear geostrategic and military advantage, it would be the vast majority of the ocean. After World War II, this blue area would have extended all the way to the perimeter of China and Southeast Asia. Because of China's increased military spending, its decision to be more global as a military power, and its claims to the South China Sea, it now enjoys something of an advantage in its own neighborhood. Without doubt, the U.S. Navy is thoroughly more impressive than the Chinese Navy. However, our Navy is dispersed all over the globe, while China's is largely concentrated in one area, giving it something of an advantage. The Quad Alliance is designed to counter China's increased presence in Southeast Asia and the South China Sea. How does one maintain an advantage when another country is growing militarily? There are options. One is to increase your own military spending. Certainly, the United States could do that. However, our yawning national debt, 
our increased internal demands for balancing a budget make it rather difficult for the U.S. to spend any more than it currently is as it relates to China. That was our policy during the Cold War. We had a very clear idea that if we could outspend the Russians, they would eventually economically implode, which is exactly what happened. Option number two is to form an alliance, to join forces with other countries so that your collective military capabilities continue to dominate the rising power. That has been our approach with the Chinese. And the Quad Alliance is another example of U.S. alliance forming with Beijing in mind. Here you can see, again, the flags of the four Quad countries with the very clear underlying intent of countering China's influence, not only in the South China Sea, but far beyond that. By the numbers, the four Quad nations make up almost one-fourth of the world's population, over one-fourth of the world's economy, and nearly half of the world's military spending. This is a powerful set of four nation-states. Recently, there was a Quad Joint Naval exercise that happened in the Indian Ocean, something that raised flags in China and led to a stern Chinese rebuke. Here we can see China's String of Pearl strategy. This is the effort by China to create ports of call all along the coastline in Southeast and South Asia, all the way to the edges of the Middle East. The Quad Joint Military activity took place in the Bay of Bengal, right at the heart of China's String of Pearls map. We were sending the message to China that we're not going to simply sit back and allow you to grow militarily in terms of your global footprint and influence without a counter-response from Washington. Here we can see an image of Mr. Biden's White House summit with the Quad leaders discussing overall strategy, with the underlying theme being the ability to counter Chinese influence. So what was placed on the formal agenda of the Quad Summit? COVID, infrastructure development, climate change initiatives, outer space, one of our 2022 great decisions, people-to-people -people exchanges, critical tech areas where cooperation would be essential, and combating cybersecurity. These are all very important issues to all of the Quad Alliance members. Let's now take a look at strategic alliances. There is a nature to them. Anytime that you see a military alliance, we look at the membership to get an idea of the character, the geographic location, and possibly some insights into what that alliance is designed for. There should be some common defining principles among those members that make the alliance logical and long-standing. And then finally, an underlying raison d'etre or reason for being. Why was the alliance created in the first place and what is its mission? As we saw with ASEAN in the previous lecture, the raison d'etre of an alliance does change. It was created in the 1960s to counter Vietnam. It morphed into a counter-China alliance in the 1990s. NATO similarly has changed dramatically, but in its origins, the members of NATO were Western allies following World War II with a number of common domestic principles, such as commitment to democracy, promotion of human rights, and a commitment to global trade. The underlying reason, of course, for NATO was to deter the Soviet Union from invading Central or Western Europe, such that an invasion against any NATO member would be legally construed as an invasion or an attack on all NATO members. NATO is viewed as the single most impressive and successful military alliance in human history. It has lasted since its establishment in 1949. One of its members was attacked by an outside party for the first time in 2001, 
with the 9-11 World Trade Center and Washington, D.C. terror strikes. NATO did respond with a joint invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. That was the first time that the key operative article of NATO was employed. NATO versus the Quad Alliance. Let's do a bit of a comparison. NATO was designed for immediate survival. Draw a very clear, bright line along the eastern edge of NATO members, or in the case of Turkey and Greece, a northern bright line. The Soviets could never cross it. Containing the Soviet Union physically was the principal aim of NATO, which of course includes deterring it from attacking a NATO member. The Quad Alliance, on the other hand, is more about positioning in the long term. There is not an immediate threat to any one of the four members of the Quad Alliance. No one is gaming out a Chinese invasion of Japan or the United States because it simply is so unlikely. Countering China is the long-term plan, not containing it. Containment requires complete success at all times. Countering simply means positioning and repositioning to blunt the influence of China in its quest for global influence. With the Soviet Union, there was a very clear record of invading neighbors and establishing puppet governments. With China, however, there's no record of invasion. China's not been at war since 1979 when it briefly invaded Vietnam and was taught a stern lesson for it. No, China's historical record is one of investment and trade. That is not something that can be contained. It can only be countered. Let's compare the Soviet Union, the focus of NATO, with China, which is the focus of the Quad Alliance. We should not treat them as the same. Yes, there were both communist powers at the time of their threat. The Soviet Union during the Cold War, China to this day, at least in name. They're both rising major powers. They're both land powers. Beyond that, the threat is quite different. For the Soviet Union, we never considered it to be a legitimate country. Moscow complained about this continuously during the Cold War that American diplomats and American presidents believed the Soviet Union and its Communist Party were illegitimate. We've not said that about China. Since we shifted from recognizing Taiwan, the Republic of China, to recognizing mainland China, People's Republic of China, we've always considered it to be a legitimate power. The Soviet Union rejected American global leadership. Its military posture and spending were designed to keep it on par with the U.S. militarily and geostrategically to maintain a bipolar world and to deny the United States a claim of global leadership and hegemony. To date, the Chinese have accepted American global leadership. Part of the reason for the difference here is that the Soviets realized that the liberal international economic order, that is the free trade system, announced in 1944 at Bretton Woods and installed globally, ran counter to its economic policies, while the Chinese, especially since the death of Mao Zedong, have gotten rich on the trading system that we've established and largely underwritten. The Soviet Union died grasping its Marxist beliefs and tenets. Even Gorbachev remained a communist to the very end, whereas the Chinese have largely abandoned Marxist orthodoxy, ideology, and tenets, instead being much more practical, pragmatic, and even a global trading power. For the Soviets, when they wanted an ally in the world, there was a very clear communist ideology test. When a nation raised the Marxist-Leninist flag, it was signaling to Moscow, we want to be your ally. You are free to ship us your money and your weaponry. China, on the other hand, has no such litmus test. It doesn't matter to China if you're a capitalist or non-capitalist country, 
democracy or authoritarian, large or small, even location doesn't seem to matter for China. They look for things, notably economic opportunity, energy resources, and future favorable votes in international organizations, but there's no ideological litmus test for China when it seeks allies across the global system. The Soviet Union had a military-centric aid policy to allies, providing them with weaponry. For China, it is an economic-centric relationship that it establishes. The Soviets fought proxy wars with the United States in places like Korea in the 1950s, Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, and beyond, while the Chinese largely refrain from military confrontation either with the United States or with our allies. China is much more careful in its international interactions than the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. The Soviet Union was crippled by its economic and political system, while the Chinese have been propelled forward by their own. Minimal trade between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, especially before detente, Kissinger obviously changed that, seeking inroads to Moscow for purposes of pursuing arms control accords. We've had maximum trade with the Chinese. And what that means is that during the Cold War, as we confronted the Soviets, not only could we militarily spin them into the grave, we could also economically sanction them without hurting us back home. China, however, because of the volume of trade, it means sanctions tariffs and quotas will have a very high cost for the United States. Here we can see the old Cold War map, the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe, the United States of course with its allies in blue on the left hand side. If the Soviet Union crossed that line, invaded a blue region, a NATO member, the red balloon went up as they say in the military and the U.S. would be at war. How, however, do you draw bright lines as it relates to China and its global economic trading practices? Here you can see the Silk Road or Belt Road Initiative. It's had many different terms. And the label that China uses varies depending on the region because the translation does have different implications. But as you can see, by land and by sea, China is reaching out in the world, building infrastructure, highways, byways, rail systems, seaports, airports, and in so doing, it's very difficult for the U.S. to draw a line and say, don't invest here. I mean, they've even reached Western Europe and NATO allies with Chinese investment projects. So the question is, where does one begin to counter the adversary, the rival? For the Soviet Union, it was pretty easy. It's the divide between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. But if we're going to go after them and try to undermine them, that's called a rollback policy. The question remains, where exactly do you go on the offensive? Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s focused on Eastern Europe. He said to them through America's liberation policy, if you rebel, we are there with you. We will support you and stand by you. And we saw rebellions happen in Hungary in the 1950s and Czechoslovakia in the 1960s. With each of those, the United States said, we're with you verbally, but nothing more. That was the Soviet sphere of influence. We could not go across that line. Mr. Reagan in the 1980s revised the rollback policy by focusing on the weak outposts places like Nicaragua, the Horn of Africa, and even Southeast Asia, forcing the Soviet Union to spend more of its dwindling resources protecting its outposts, as Brezhnev called them, its far-flung allies. That was a much more successful policy and a much less dangerous one than challenging the Soviets in their own backyard. With China, it's borderline impossible to find a place to counter effectively. What exactly are we going to say to countries in the Caribbean? Stop taking Chinese loans? Especially since we're not prepared to replace those Chinese loans. 
Don't misunderstand me. Many, if not most of the countries that borrow money from China grow to regret it. They realize the terms are not that favorable. The infrastructure project doesn't pay the dividends that they had anticipated, but by then it is too late. And as noted earlier, now China is even reaching into the European Union and NATO for its investment projects. It's just a very different rival for us to counter than was the Soviet Union during the Cold War era. It's a deal that's too good to turn down, and very few countries do turn it down. So the Quad Alliance, in many ways, is a default strategy. We cannot head off Chinese investments abroad, even in our allied regions of Europe, so let's form a geostrategic alliance that boxes China in militarily. Here we can see an image of the Quad Alliance meeting. This is actually a portion of the alliance because the United Kingdom is not a member. It is Mr. Biden on the right and the Australian head of government in the center, and they are announcing a new nuclear submarine deal. This made headlines across the globe, but especially in France, because France had an existing multi-billion dollar deal with Australia for diesel-powered submarines. That was ditched in favor of the more obviously impressive one offered by the U.S. and the United Kingdom. This tells us that the U.S. is beginning to prioritize the Quad Alliance over individual bilateral relations, even with NATO allies. How about this pivot that's happening to Asia? This is certainly a major force that's led to the Quad Alliance. The question is why? Why are we going to the eastern portion of Asia in particular? Well, there are some obvious reasons. The new center of power is there. China is an emerging global power. It's located in Asia. Let's focus our attention there. Shifting away from the modest policies of trying to rebuild nations like Iraq, Libya, and Afghanistan, and instead focusing upon big picture issues, like who is the dominant power in the world, and how can we learn to live with and work with the Chinese. Our failures in Central and Western Asia, we've been burned very badly in the Middle East in particular, and the edges of that region, we should try a different area of the world. And finally, the economic opportunity that is there. There are some significant and growing economies in Asia, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea. It's logical from an economic point of view to spend our foreign policy energy working on policies oriented towards the Pacific and the Asian continent. And I don't mean all of Asia, of course, when I talk about the pivot there. Asia is a very large and diverse continent, many countries, very large portion of the global population, as we saw in an earlier lecture in this series. There is the portion of Asia that's part of the Middle East, ranging from Turkey to Iran and the Arabian Peninsula. There is South Asia, which is dominated by India and Pakistan. There is Central Asia, which is the, the stands of the world. There is Southeast Asia, which we looked at recently. When we talk about the pivot to Asia, we probably draw the line about here. India and China toward, to the east, including Southeast Asia and the Pacific Rim. That's where the power, population, military spending, and economies can be found. Nearly half of the world's population resides in that part of Asia to the right of this yellow line. All right, we've taken a look now at the three considerations. Let's consider U.S. foreign policy. Strategies to deal with China range on the spectrum from a soft line to a hard line approach. Playing the long game is the soft line. This means a lot of confidence that in the end we're better off than China and we will prevail as the rules are currently written and as the global system is arranged. The hardline side, we have the neoconservative or neocon strategy. The long game, priority on trade and profit with the underlying assumption 
that as the Chinese become wealthier and more invested, they'll be less likely to challenge the U.S. as the top country in the geostrategic pyramid. It makes a lot of sense because the wealthier you are and the more you trade, especially with other rivals, the higher the cost of military engagement with them. The neoconservative strategy is very different. It begins with the premise that the U.S. is the dominant geostrategic, military, political, economic power of the world, and any nation state, communist or non, ally or enemy, long history or short one, any country that's rising is a threat to the United States and must be dealt with immediately. We often associate the neocon strategy with Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as Libya under the Obama administration. Most of the neocons, of course, were found in the George W. Bush administration. And that was a strategy of toppling dictators and promoting democracy. That's a different part of the neocon strategy. The traditional approach is to tamp down on any rising power, and that would mean confrontation with China. There are, of course, plenty of options in between, including a counterbalancing strategy, which is what we see with the Quad Alliance. Why it makes sense. If the U.S. seeks to separate from China, finding key allies around China makes a lot of sense. It's logical. Creating an alliance with these four countries passes the eyeball test as we look at a map of Asia and the Pacific. Disentangling our trade and supply chain lines requires finding new allies in that region where labor is competitive, and we can find other sources of many of the products that we consume as a nation. And then finally, add both South Korea and Vietnam to the Quad Alliance. There have been some talk of this, maybe as associate members, if not full members of the Quad Alliance. If you were to ask me which of these two countries impresses me most today and into the future, without hesitation, I'm going to say the United States. This is the global power of the 21st century. We are hampered largely by internal variables. We're shooting ourselves in the foot politically. We have two political parties that are borderline dysfunctional, a Democratic Party that is so diverse that is so divided, it has a hard time unifying, and a Republican Party that is loyal to one personality. These are not healthy trends on either side of the political line, but they're manageable if the two parties could work together. But as you will note in 2022, there's virtually no bipartisan agreement in Washington, D.C., and that means it's very difficult for the United States to move forward in the most optimal fashion. China is advantaged domestically. It is a dictatorship. One voice makes a decision for all, but there are so many deficits in China, geographically, geostrategically, and demographically. Those three key variables that we use to project where a country will be in 30, 50, or 80 years, they're not very positive for China. And as it continues to reach out into the world, there will be natural counterbalances against it, not just the Quad Alliance, but by local and regional powers, there will be a resistance movement emerging against China in those areas. So if I'm going to place a bet on which country does best this century, no doubt it's the United States. Thank you for attending this lecture. Do stay engaged and make great decisions. Wow, was he good, yeah? Excellent. Um, I have this DVD at home. If anybody wants to borrow it, you can give me one of your credit cards, and I'll let you take it because it's a $40 DVD, so I, I don't want to have to replace it. Um, oh, where's my notes for
Yeah, I don't need to appear on the TV screen. It's all right. Um, the world's largest paperclip. It's interesting to sit behind our speaker because he has not seen this DVD, and I'm, I'm watching him take in this information and sort it out in his head, and it'll show up in his remarks to you. So um, that, that's just fascinating to see. Um, let me do a quick biography for you. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen him before, he arrived first time last year and did a presentation and just blew people away with his encyclopedic knowledge of world affairs. Um, his area of specialization, and this is Sir William Say, S-E-A-Y. Yeah, his area of specialization is international political economy, uh, which is an umbrella for so much. He was educated at the London School of Economics in Cambridge, and is an alumnus of the VCU School of Education, so several of us are. Um, he teaches honors political economy for the department at VCU, as well as introductory political economy and global financial history. He lives between Richmond, Virginia and London. Um, his honors include he is a, invested as a member, apprentice knight, and you gotta look this up because it's great fun to see this, Apprentice Knight into the Venerable Order of St. John, Britain's oldest religious order of chivalry. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II invested him with that honor. And His Royal Highness Prince Richard II, Duke of Gloucester. 2014, he was made Sir. His biography includes who's who in the world and who's who in America since 2008. Uh, he was born in Bayswater, West London, near Kensington Palace. That is his home district. He still has a family home there. Uh, many of his early childhood summers were spent in Montreal, Canada, where his father was an assignment there. Um, he was, and, and why was he invested a night? Um, for teaching and missionary preaching to underprivileged youth, as well as to the adult illiterate many of whom pursued university as well as vocational education, and are now, because of this lift up, are free from a lifetime bondage of substance and domestic abuse they once knew. Um, he practiced this both in the United States and in the United Kingdom. London, New York, Washington, D.C., most recently, um, Northern Virginia, and now Richmond. He's a parish minister here in his spare time, and he, he's completed sen seminary training at both Union Pre Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, as well as Princeton Theological Seminary, just next to Princeton University in New Jersey. His home church is Genito Presbyterian Church, USA Parish in Powhatan County. He's also licensed in, in the Anglican and Methodist churches, which has, he, he has supplied as pastor on occasion. Does he have hobbies? Yes. Reading, traveling, teaching, writing, two books are being uh, completed at present, and living a life of ministry and compassion to all every day. So please re welcome our extraordinary speaker, Sir William Say. I, I can certainly stand here. Thank you. We can, we can keep it here for the moment. Go, go, go for it. No problem. Good morning. And a very belated Happy New Year to you. It, it is a great, great joy to return to speak with you again about the world. Not always a pleasant world, but a world full of reality that we must indeed embrace, analyze, for those of us who have spiritual paths that we walk, no matter what they happen to be, pray, be kind and compassionate to one another, and understand that we are all the same in many diverse ways, but also very, very different in our outlook on life. And the reason that this particular point of view is addressed first and foremost 
is, as Professor Morton mentioned, we as not only people of the United States of America, but also in the world itself, were exposed to a political philosophy called neoconservatism in the early 2000s especially when George W. Bush was, of course, the two-term president and had the war on terror with which to deal. We won't say that the intentions weren't good. We won't say that there also weren't some human nature, self selfish pursuits involved, perhaps with some of the role players with the George W. Bush administration, but what matters philosophically is that it was the neoconservative philosophy that drove the foreign policy of the United States of America during those years. And neoconservative political policy, to be perfectly fair, is something that we may fairly understand as a political philosophy that has good intentions, but one in which we must be careful not to use much of henceforward, whether one is an actual conservative or liberal, it matters not. It matters not as per the fact that neoconservatism began with a very liberal democratic senator, a man by the name of Senator Henry Scoop Jackson from the state of Washington. And it is very important to remember that he embraced a very middle path liberal philosophy, one that we need to understand was full of good intent, but one that unfortunately could not be applied to the parts of the world that we had to certainly enter during the early 2000s. We can, very good indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, of course, stay behind the line, yes. The Maginot line, yes. What is very important, before we go any further, is the microphone, does it need to be a bit louder, please? Lovely. Lovely indeed. What is very important to remember is that neoconservatism, although embraced by conservative Republicans, was started by an American Democrat who very much had the liberal philosophy of utopianism, one that was believed to be what would make the League of Nations at the end of World War I to World War II a success. And certainly the League of Nations was in some small respects concerning handling some issues of world poverty, the use of poisonous gas and, and Alon. Having said that, however, the philosophy of the neoconservatives that became distinctive in the sense that it embraced the idea, the very realist idea, that we may indeed need to go to war and use very excessive force in various situations. And that indeed is a true philosophy. But we have to also remember that another, em another embraced philosophy of the neoconservatives was actually the very liberal perspective, the very liberal utopian perspective that all people, for the most part, are the same. Again, and as we should understand, that is true in some respects, but not a philosophy that we can apply to every part of the world. We cannot apply that philosophy to the Middle East, and even if possible, certainly not to every Middle Eastern civilization. For example, there was a belief towards the middle and end of the last century that Turkey, being a very modern republic, modeled after France in some respects from the year 1924 forward, would be a role model for the, of democracy for the other Middle Eastern countries to follow. But then comparing, for example, Turkey as well as what became Iraq or Saudi Arabia or Iran certainly is very similar to comparing a cantaloupe and a watermelon, to be perfectly honest. We have to be very careful in how we make these generalizations and try our very best to avoid them as much as we can. 
And so the reason that the hopefully positive critique, fair critique of neoconservatism has been addressed is because of the fact that, unfortunately, it was one with presented, as we understand, with good intentions when the war on terror began in the early middle 2000s, and one that was implemented towards Iraq as well as Afghanistan, but one that proved very catastrophic, one that proved not to work, especially when you're dealing with diverse populations of the Islamic world, such as Iraq, as well as Afghanistan. And so we therefore need to ask ourselves the question, what sort of political, philosophical, international relations policy should we have whilst dealing with Russia, as well as China, especially with the Quad Alliance? Should we take a neoconservative perspective, well, as Professor Morton said in a few but very fair words, most likely not after what we saw, saw in Afghanistan as well as in Iraq. And so therefore the $64 billion question or trillion dollar question, um, making it uh, national debt natural, um, is what sort of political philosophy should we adhere to. I should like to begin by reminding you of a gentleman who recently retired from Harvard University, a man by the name of Professor Joseph Nye, capital N-Y-E, no relation to the science guy on PBS. <laughs> Professor Joseph Nye was the assistant defense secretary under President Bill Clinton in the 1990s, and it was, pre it was Professor Nye uh, who recently wrote a book called um, Morality and American Presidents, Is It Always Wrong to Lie? But his most, he has some very colorful comments to make there. But what makes Joseph Nye so important at this moment is he introduced to us his own international relations concept called soft power. And he made the argument that soft power was a credible, not perfect, but a credible approach in international relations to containing as well as countering, as well as countering other powerful forces, other powerful nations whose interests and those of the powerful Western nations may often collide, whether it's containment or in the case of Russia as well as China, countering, especially, especially with China. With Russia, however, depending on what occurs in the Ukraine, possibly over the next several hours or the next few days, it may also be a policy of containment, once again, as well as countering. But let us talk about um, soft power, soft power for a moment. It is a cooperative a cooperative strategy to be used in international relations. And it was actually, and it does have its negative sides, but yet sides that we can certainly argue that may be countered or triple, double countered, shall we say. Soft power has nothing to do with coercing people through military force. It has to do with working together, working together and finding an actual balance of interests, an actual balance of interests. Henry Kissinger, who has some obviously questionable views by no stretch of the matter a stupid man, but a man whose strategies have often been held in question, to be fair, uh, did actually mention once that if we look at the Congress of Vienna that ended the Napoleon, that was the Congress that ended the Napoleonic Wars in 1814 and 1815. What was actually, and this was Kissinger's doctoral dissertation at Harvard on the Vienna Congress. In fact, his advisor was a man by the name of Dr. William Elliott, who was a Shenandoah Valley of Virginia native, uh, interesting enough, a, a man who graduated from Vanderbilt. But the actual, we have, 
the argument, the, the, very, the very direct argument that was made was that in the Vienna Congress that, that officially that began to bring an end to the, war, the Napoleonic Wars in 1814, 1815, the solution was that a balance of interests were found in terms of taking countries such as certainly France um, after Napoleon. Unfortunately, uh, there was a man by the name of Talleyrand who was a former Roman Catholic priest and had actually been Napoleon's foreign secretary until he had had enough of Napoleon paying Alexander the Great that he resigned. And so Talleyrand, Talleyrand uh, Father Talleyrand, um, ac uh, actually attended the Vienna Congress and he did make it very clear that it was important, um, it was definitely very important um, to recognize the fact that France was still the largest physical country in the western part of Europe and in the very northeastern part of Eurasia, Eurasia, it was none other than Imperial Russia. And so there needed to be a balance of, a balance of interest that were found at the Vienna Congress and that was um, actually f having some strategic lands um, but then there was Poland, Poland. Napoleon actually created the city-state of the Duchy, um, the, the, uh, the Duchy of Warsaw, uh, and the people in Warsaw were very pro-French, they were very pro-Napoleon, believing at first that he was the actual spirit of the French Revolution, and of course he knew he was. He, all you had to do was ask him and he would tell you I am the state. And so it was agreed by, a gen by the planners, led by an actual Austrian nobleman named Prince Clemens von Metternich, that a, s a portion of Poland that wanted to be protected by the French military, Warsaw and even the southwestern part of Poland, uh, would indeed be given to France for military protection. And then the northeastern part of Poland would be given militarily as well as economically because of the rich seaports in northeastern Poland to Imperial Russia. But then there was someone else, the largest German kingdom of all at the time. Again, we're still at the Congress of Vienna, 1814, 1815. Prussia, whose capital was Berlin. And as many of you probably remember, Prussia um, Prussia was actually the German kingdom that united most of what became the German Empire under its rule during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-1871 and because of God speaking to Otto von Bismarck and telling him to for, um, forge, a, forge a few letters. But anyhow, there we go. All right, well, it worked for, it worked for, some, worked for some people in the Old Testament. I suppose. Anyhow, but there you go. But there you, there you have it. Um, but so Prussia said, we want the, we want the very northwestern tip of Poland, uh, especially, especially the port of Danzig, which is now called Gdansk and has been called Gdansk ever since the end of World War I. And so the balance of interest were, some balance of interest were found for four very important, some military, strategic, as well as economic, balance of interests were found for, for France, the largest physical country in all of Western Europe, Prussia, the largest German kingdom, as well as certainly the largest imperial empire um, to the northeast, imperial Russia. But Poland, fortunately, was given credit for having a balance of interest, a desire to have a balance of interest with these three countries as well. Uh, due to the fact that they valued the French Revolution in Warsaw and certainly the southwestern part of Poland, from Warsaw going to the southwest, there was a very pro-French revolutionary, very pro-French revolutionary community of Poles that wanted military, that wanted to be a military protected zone, or a protectorate of France. And so the southwestern part of Poland became such. Then you had uh, the northwestern part of Poland who actually uh, was very proud to say that some of their land in Prussia was once a part of Poland. So economically and, uh, economically and militarily, we are most happy to allow our northwestern Polish district, our territory, to be part of uh, Prussia. 
And then there was northeast, the northeastern corner of Poland, which also included some countries that were called the Polish-Lithuanian Confederation countries, particularly Lithuania, who were very happy to be militarily as well as economically under, the, under Russia, under Imperial Russia. And the reason that, and, and, and so it was a balance of interests that actually created what seemed to be a successful balance of power from the end of the Napoleonic Wars with the Congress of Vienna, 1814, 1815 forward. Of course, there were some nationalist uprisings in Eastern Europe, such as in Hungary and so forth, and that will always occur when people begin to wave flags and also realize that they have become a bit stronger economically than they may have expected. And so with soft power, um, not, not, not getting terribly close to Henry Kissinger in this regard, but certainly getting, coming, back to, coming back to Joseph Nye, it is still an, a point of emphasis in using soft power international relations policies for nations that have tension with one another or perhaps not tension with one another but are very close to having uh, some possible economic strategic, and strategic, political strategic as well as economic tension in the future to therefore find still a balance of interest through cooperation. And this can be done economically as well as through cultural exchanges. Um, what we, of course, the United States of America actually used what one would call soft power with China during the late 1990s, well, going all the way back to the Beijing spring of 19, March of 1978, when President Carter went to meet with President Deng Xiaoping. And what did President Deng Xiaoping say? He was actually the supreme paramount leader. We, I use the word president, but that's actually a, a more ceremonial title in China. As paramount supreme leader of China, Deng Xiaoping said in March of 1978, to the newly elected Democratic President Jimmy Carter, I am very glad you have come here to discuss bringing our interests together, especially economically. Because you, as, you, as per the fact you have come here, Mr. Co Mr. President, we will now begin to slowly but surely have economic relations with America and create what is called socialism with the Chinese face. And what Deng Xiaoping meant by that in 1978 is there has always been a Chinese face on the world economy. We saw the, 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 the string of pearls pathway that the Chinese Navy has actually made to hopefully counter or keep in place the Quad Alliance. That sea path that Professor Morton showed is the sea path that the Chinese have known also very well for thousands of years because the oldest, the oldest import in the world is Chinese silk. Persian silk was Chinese silk. The other important import is Chinese brass. And during the, 14, during the 1418 to 1421 period, which was during the Ming dynasty or the Ming dynasty, uh, Chinese junk ships, Chinese merchant ships piloted by Chinese Muslims left Fujian province and sailed to the Philippines, to Singapore, which was a part of Malaya, or Malaysia as we now call it, and all the way to the Malabar coast in India and all the way to Kenya. And so the Chinese have, all, what, the Chi, what Deng Xiaoping was actually saying to President Carter is, it is good that you have chosen the path of discussing collaboration of economic interests with us. We know economic, we know the global, we know the global economy very well. We have actually helped create it in the last few thousand years. And Deng Xiaoping, communist or not, knew his onions, to be honest with you, in that regard. Unfortunately, he uh, was after having some, a successful trip one, a year later to the United States and then again in 1982, of course went down in Chinese as well as world political history 
as not a very nice person after the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, and we certainly understand that. But the balance of interest that was found was a soft power cooperation that President Jimmy Carter actually used with Deng Xiaoping to slowly but surely put America and China, as well as China, on the road to having 100% free trade with each other um, in 2000 um, after the World Trade Organization, very much under US, rooting, uh, uh, US um, cheering, gave China most favorite nation status econo economically in 1998. Um, and so soft power has, was actually what, ladies and gentlemen, helped develop better relations international relations between America and China. What is, however, um, what is, however, the downside of soft power is that those people who use the soft power instrument you give them can certainly either intentionally or unintentionally or simply with no necessarily dislike can still turn the tables and become more powerful. Uh, China ended up um, using the soft power cooperation from America especially with all of the, the majority, so much of the, almost the whole of American manufacturing being sent to China to actually, um, actually become most powerful as far as the number one world exporter is concerned. And the majority of companies in China that are giving great, great fierce competition to America are actually privately owned Chinese companies, privately owned Chinese companies. And so, um, China, therefore, used American, the examples of American soft power to strengthen itself and actually rise up in various ways against America. Now, economically, become stronger. Now, that doesn't mean that there still aren't, aren't economic problems in China that fortunately don't exist in America. As many of you may know, the Chinese are often not able to afford, are not able to afford to buy many of the things they make. Which is why South Korea, which, which is why Samsung from South Korea sells more Android, sells about 14% of its Android phones in the PRC. And so it is very important to keep in mind that soft power has actually worked, even though it should have been taken with limits. Um, it, sh it, sh it should have been, it should have been conducted and certainly pursued with limits economically. Um, for example, Germany. Germany was in China five years before America with 100% free trade, um, and, but yet Germany continued to, has continued to be the number one exporter in the West and was actually the number one exporter in the world until China moved to the number one spot in 2009, especially after the financial debacle here. Uh, but what, so what did Germany do? Germany used a version, to be fair, Germany, and we, we hear a lot about Germany trying to appease Russia at the moment, um, but here, because of the pipeline, the oil pipeline that goes from Russia across the Ukraine into Poland and Germany, um, but what is very important here is Germany used what was called soft power with competitive advantage, a competitive advantage, whereas, whereas America, under Bill Clinton, to a very large degree, gave very much of the farm away. Um, and what, what Germany did was they said, we're certainly going to send factories to China. You want to send factories to China? Balance of interests, part of soft power. Even something that Henry Kissinger mentioned, but Joseph Nye put into a more calmer, softer tone, especially in terms of not thinking militarily or strategically, but in terms of keeping military and strategic problems possibly less problematic by cooperating economically and culturally with other countries. Well, here's how we're going to cooperate economically with China. We Germans are going to open up factories in China, but we're going to keep some factories here. We're going to pay Chinese workers competitive wages the same wages we would pay our own workers, and we're going to send Germans, fellow Germans, to China to work side by side in Shandong province or anywhere in the outskirts of Shanghai with the Chinese, with the Chinese. 
And we, we, our German firms are even going to pay incentive money to privately owned Chinese companies that Deng Xiaoping allowed to become private if they were able to make a competitive product as a result of his meeting with President Carter. Um, we are going to actually, our German businesses, Siemens, for example, Siemens is going to pay incentive money to Chinese, privately owned Chinese companies that make some of the same electrical, robotic gadgets and so forth, competitive wages so that competitive wages as well, so that maybe perhaps eventually the Chinese worker working for the privately owned Chinese company can buy some things that a China, fellow Chinese person has made, made working for Siemens and vice versa. And we keep the free market competition of goods going. To be fair, however, the soft power was simply done in a political economic level with more of a political uh, seasoning to it when Bill Clinton uh, was actually president. Uh, we're going to send manufacturing to China, a good portion of manufacturing to China, and which was not illogical on its own. Germany had already done it five years earlier with their own economy. But we're going to do it certainly to conserve resources, which was perfectly acceptable. But, uh, but on the other hand, it was also something that caused manufacturing jobs to go down and wages and much some of the middle class to go down quite a bit, to certainly decrease quite a bit in America, particularly by the middle and late 2000s. And so soft power needs to be used in a competitive way, which is very much what the Germans did in the 1990s. And so soft power would be perhaps a good way to say to China, or to work with China and say, we want to continue to have economic relations with you, but in a more competitive manner in which um, we certainly will allow, um, we will certainly allow American companies to continue to, to come, but at the same time, we want to have, we, we should follow very much what is called, and this is a word I know that scares very many people, the social capitalist approach that the Germans used. Germany has a political econ economy called social capitalism, which is not overall the same as socialism, although there are certainly some connections. Um, unfortunately, preferential treatment is given to some of the bigger co corporations in Germany, and that's not a good thing, uh, whereas the smaller, medium startup companies need to be given more incentive money as well. But what Germany does is it gives incentive money to corporations to grow, to train their workers in more competitive skills, and not get rid of workers, but train them in more competitive skills to keep them and to allow them to make the, uh, the economy as well as the, the product more competitive, uh, more of a bestseller on the world market, and as a re reward, all of the German workers become investors in each of the companies where they work. That is why Deutsche Bank is called the best investment bank in the world, although they had a few, um, a few, uh, toxic, um, toxic, uh, secure, uh, a few toxic securities as well that were passed on to London through their actual, through their actual um, London branch. Um, but soft power would certainly be, if China gets too abrupt, China gets perhaps too abrupt indeed, and says, well, we're, we're going to expand our navy, we're going to expand this string of pearl naval pathway in the sea where we, we put ourselves side by side by you, the Aussies, uh, you, the Aussies, the, in, the, the Indians, certainly, and the Japanese. What America could do is say, well, we will, uh, we will certainly, uh, what we will do is we will practice soft power to expand our economy um, where you are right now, where we can compete with each other and bring out the best in each other economically. China, you're in Africa now. Africa is basically known as China's continent as per Ch the Chinese owning virtually all of the oil industries from the Sudan, from the two Sudans, we have now have two Sudans as I'm sure you know, all the way down to Mozambique and Angola, former Portuguese colonies. Well. 
American firms, as well as some other NATO EU firms, well, ELF, the French uh, company, has already been there for several years, been in, in actually the north central part of Africa, but some American firms could indeed go to Africa and compete side by side with China and uh, work not in a vicious tooth and nail manner, but do very much as perhaps the Germans have done and, um, and certainly pay some of the ch privately owned Chinese companies in Africa that are competing side by side with American companies to pay African workers who still may not have running water, to be honest, where, from where they come, pay them some competitive wage and so forth and, and, and keep so, and, and, and help create an, an economic equilibrium. And there already is an equilibrium, although it's one in which China and America unfortunately have a, a, a tight grip upon one another. Um, for every one dollar that America owes China, China owes America 89 cents to the dollar. And there's no hope of seeing either side, Beijing or Washington, pay any of it back. China also owns 10% of American treasury bonds, which explains why America borrows so much of its own money back from China and OPS at 11% interest rates from Shanghai. Not good. And so it would be much better, perhaps, to have a soft power economic approach with China uh, to say, let's continue to be partners, but let's work together to find ways to meet each other in other parts of the world to compete with each other and to pay our, our firms incentive money to train our workers the best, pay each other competitive wages, help keep both America and China the two most diverse economies in the world, and we might even be able to bring a bit of our debt down one to another. It won't be perfect, but we might, not, we might be able to bring some of our foreign debt down to one another. National debt is never a good thing. But let's remember, America became a very powerful country, still owing itself money from World War II. What matters is foreign debt. Foreign debt is where any nation, in this case the United States or China, needs to concern itself. And so if we could find some soft power, economic, important phrase, economic cooperation with one another, where we meet each other halfway in Australia, for example. Australia actually has China down on its knees economically speaking, in regards to the mineral industry. Australia, particularly Western Australia, is the mineral capital of the world. And the richest woman in the world is the Australian CEO of the mineral company, uh, the mineral co corporations there in Western Australia. Certainly what America and Australia could both do is come together and form an economic alliance with China, the three because you have, and, so, and get Japan involved as well. Um, but focus perhaps more on Australia at the moment because of the important economic ties, the mandatory economic tie that the People's Republic has with, or, or China has with Australia. What the People's Republic of China could do with Australia is they could have competitive advantage with each other economically. And America and Australia both, um, some American firms, could go and build some steel manufacturing industries in Western Australia, in the northwestern part of near Perth, um, especially if China gets very aggressive and starts continuing to charge extremely high prices for aluminum, also known as aluminum, as, and also, and also, um, also uh, steel. Of course, a lot of, a lot of that, to be very honest, um, came, and I do not mean to offend anyone's politics here, but I, a fact is a fact, and I, this is not meant to be partisan, but when, when the last political leader of America, uh, Mr. Trump, decided to go on a trade war with China, um, not that there should not have been any um, sort of strict measures ever taken in trade with China, but to simply start putting tariffs on Chinese goods very abruptly knowing that we, that, that America needs the Chinese market as they need us, that simply led to China charging more for aluminum as well as steel, uh, fight fire with fire. It doesn't intimidate us at all. If Washington and Beijing, however, as we saw during the summer of 2020 when we had enough going on in the world, more than enough going on, especially prayers and 
hope that our lives were going to, we would still be alive the next day because of COVID. Um, if, the, if, if, we can, if Washington and Beijing can come together in tense moments such as that, economically, why the, could they not therefore continue to go back to cooperating uh, as they began to do at the end of the late 1970s, but to do so in a soft, soft economic power way that promotes competitive advantage, not comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is the, is, is the free trade strategy of finding a cheap trade-off uh, between two nations uh, and one nation therefore buying more of another nation's products that it doesn't necessarily need to buy to conserve resources. And that was actually the work of a London bond trader named David Ricardo. Princess Anne now lives at his home, uh, um, Gatcombe uh, Park in, in Gloucestershire. Um, but at the same time, Adam Smith would have said, would, would, have, would have put the flag up and said, tut tut, you still need to keep that competitive edge because you don't want someone who, you don't want a much larger country, or even a country that's small but a bit larger than yours, eventually gulping you up, uh, swallowing you up. And that's exactly what happened between England and Portugal over the cloth industry in the early 1800s. And so um, the economic soft power could also be done as a way to counter any sort of aggression from China militarily or economically by, for example, and Professor Morton made a brief mentioning of this, mention about this, America could, United States firms could certainly go to Australia and open up some steel and manufacturing there. And we certainly could do it in India. India is the largest, ladies and gentlemen, the largest producer of steel and export, producer as well as exporter of steel to the African continent. And that was one of the reasons why it appeared as though India, along with Brazil, and of course it, both, it, it all faded after 2009, there were high hopes that India, as well as Brazil, would end up becoming great emerging economic superpowers or quasi-superpowers and possibly strategic, uh, strategic partners as well, which of course India has become in the Quad Alliance. And so, some soft power economic, soft power economic strategies to improve relations with China or to counter them being militant by saying, China, we're not going to argue with you, but if you're going to keep raising the price of, if, if you, Beijing, want to keep raising the prices of, uh, of certainly industrial goods that you ship back to Long Beach or Seattle, uh, we're just going, we're going to open up shop. We're not going to close business with you. You need us, we need you. But we are going to open up 100% um, open free trade with Australia. And why not? The Australian dollar back and forth for the last 10 years has been the sixth most purchased currency in the world. The Canadian dollar has been the seventh. And uh, America could also do the same thing by having an economic soft power alliance, economic economic soft power alliance that could hopefully develop into a better political soft power alliance with, with India. Um, we need to remember something very, very important. India is actually far more satisfied with America these days. President Obama went to the Bali conference of the World Trade Organization uh, thanks to the American Thanksgiving weekend of 2013. He made it, uh, made it a point to go. And he made it very clear that America was going to heal some wounds with India from the Doha round from Qatar, which occurred, which was a World Trade Organization meeting in 2001. We are going, Washington is going to stop paying subsidies to India as well as Mongolia, not to, not to grow and export as much of their wheat around the world. And, and so that put a smile on India's face, and India is, is actually more, con more confident than ever that economic relations can continue to grow wonderfully with America. And oh, an economic soft power relation was actually started in 1962 under John F. Kennedy listening to John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a Canadian-American economist at Harvard and who became his, uh, Kennedy's main economic advisor. John Kenneth Galbraith had also worked with President FDR during the Great Depression. And uh, had he been allowed to stay in office, 
FDR would have done well to have listened to him because of his, and, and the, the New Deal programs could have perhaps improved um, and not stagnated some things the way some of them did. Um, but we had what was called the Delhi, the Delhi, named after, of course, Delhi, the capital of India, India's capital, the Delhi round in summer of 1962. John Kenneth Galbraith said to President Kennedy, you, we need to go to Delhi. We need to go to India and talk about opening up some good economic free trade with India. We need them as a strategic ally against um, possibly uh, against possibly the so Soviet Union, against the Soviet Union. President Kennedy went. He actually met with Nehru, who was who died uh, two year, one year after Kennedy, after Kennedy's assassination. And during 1962, the United States opened up 100% PPP, purchasing power parity, purchasing power equality with India. Since 1962, America and India, India is actually, let, let, let me polish that up a bit and say that India is actually the number one, the only country in the world that has purchasing power equality with the American dollar. And that, and that is one of the things that helped get India going quite well economically from 1962 forward. And since John Kenneth Galbraith gave so much good advice to President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy therefore gave him the job as US ambassador to India from 1962 forward. So, some soft power economic competitive, competitive um, alliances with India began to work, and then, and also with China as well, and with China, um, with China as well. Now, as far as the actual quad is concerned, and so let us, let us hope, and for those of us who have spiritual beliefs, you know, let us hope, let us pray that perhaps one way to say to counter any sort of tension with China economically, militarily, is to have a more open relation with China as far as actual having a competitive, let's bring out the best in each other's businesses alliance and, and do the same with India, but also warn China that if you're going to get too, aggr if you're going to get too aggressive with America militarily, because of our military presence in the South, the Indo-Pacific Indo region with the Quad, we are going to just, uh, we're not going to fight you. We're going to keep our Quad alliance with Japan, Australia, and India there, but we're going to move house somewhere else. We're going to keep, some, keep the factories in China, keep goods being made from China, but we're going to also give Australia a chance to have 100% free trade. And we're going to open up freer trade with India, and together we will strengthen each other economically. And hopefully, you, China, will realize that when we learn, we, the United States, learn to play a more competitive, yet let's bring out the best in each other, soft power economic alliance with our fellow allies in Australia, with Japan. Japan wanted to loan American dollars to President Obama in 2009 to bail out businesses, by the way. Let's keep that in mind. That didn't happen. But Pres uh, Prime Minister Abe, back in 2009, wanted to do that. So there, there was an opportunity to create at least a slow, soft power economic alliance. And the same could be done with India. Um, and uh, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, by working in cooperation to stimulate one another economically, perhaps we could bring the military tensions down and maybe not have as much of the Quad Alliance have it there. We have to keep it there but not as much of it. Russia, of course, is a different story. Russia, by all means, is a different story. Where we went wrong with Russia was in 1991, the name of the game was, let's put Russia through electric shock therapy. Um, actually, it was called financial, electric financial shock therapy. And so the World Bank, under the influences of Professor Milton Friedman, the chief monetarist of the world, uh, also Ronald Reagan's advisor in the 1980s, put Russia into what was called economic shock therapy. We, the World Bank, are not going to give you any US dollars to improve yourselves economically until you turn everything in Russia overnight over to private enterprise. Well, there wasn't any private enterprise except the Russian mafia. Well, if that's the case, where are the Sopranos? <laughs> or the Cor Corleones? I, anyhow, we, but there you go. But, um, so that was, that, was, that was totally, totally, totally horrendous. 
we made a wreck, unfortunately, out of Russia economically. In some respects, it's understandable that we were focusing more on trying to improve Russia politically because of all the political and strategic military tension that existed between Washington and Moscow during the Cold War. But ladies and gentlemen, it's very important to keep in mind that when we have a strong balance of power, balance of interests, economically, through cooperation, not that the cooperation is always going to be easy, not that it will be perfect, not that it won't have its, pot its potholes, there is a possibility of quelling political, strategic, military tension as well. Please. No, no, indeed. Uh, when you mentioned um, Carter um, this morning in the paper, there was an article about. Uh, Nixon and how he was one of the, the first to uh, make overtures towards China. Can you um, speak to that and did that sort of lead to Sure. Carter? I, I began with Carter because it was more economic. Um, we all know that Henry Kissinger was, sec was the national security advisor to Henry Kissinger during, excuse me, to Richard Nixon. I'm sure he probably would have liked to have been it to himself too, but anyhow. <laughs> Um, but anyhow, as well, but um, Henry Kissinger was the national security advisor to Richard Nixon during Nixon's first term of office. Then Nixon made him Secretary of State um, before the uh, Watergate tango occurred. Um, so there you are. Um, Kissinger went on a secret trip to Beijing in 1972, and then um, Kissinger made it, no, made, made it very clear that he was going to take make it an open trip again, uh, make an open trip, uh, no secret to the American or global public in 1973, actually. And of course, um, Kissinger and Nixon both had just traveled to Paris earlier that year to negotiate with the North Vietnamese to bring an end to the war with Vietnam under what was called a, vic uh, a peace with no victory. Um, what Henry Kissinger wanted to do was he wanted to focus more on discussing with China uh, the importance of being strategic allies with hopes of being, with, with hopes of hopes of discussing economic relations later down the road and I, and, and that's also what he and President Kiss, uh, President Nixon discussed uh, in, in open but the, the, the first go with Kissinger was to, was to have this, was to have China and uh, Chairman Mao was still alive during that time and the supreme paramount leader of China was a man by the name of Cho, capital C-H-O-U. His name was Cho Unlai, and uh, he was a very open-minded fellow. He was, uh, Cho was the paramount leader of China. He had been the paramount leader of China, the number one supreme leader since the, uh, end, um, the end of the 1950s. And he um, was the man who said, um, we are no longer friends with the Soviet Union because we, the Chinese, Communists didn't like, the, didn't like Stalin, so we need to make ourselves more available economically to the rest of the world. And so Cho went to what was called the Bandung Conference in Indonesia in 1957. The Bandung Conference, capital B-A-N-D-U-N-G in Indonesia, was a UN conference in which China uh, actually wanted to make itself more transparent economically to third world countries. And during 1957, Cho opened up some free, not complete, but some free trade relations with India, with India, as well as with um, Kenya. So Henry Kissinger knew that Cho was a, was a reasonable man to talk to, and so Kissinger, not that he didn't have some things up his sleeve, obviously, but he, Kissinger went privately in um, to talk to um, Cho and also Chairman Mao, mainly to Cho, um, and the, what Kissinger, the strategy that Kissinger used was, let's talk about being good strategic partners and then about slowly opening up economic relations with each other. 
which again probably would have happened with Nixon had Nixon not resigned because of Watergate. So I have a very strong feeling that had Nixon carried on, um, especially he, he would have carried on, especially he had uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson Rockefeller as his uh, vice president the second time, well, uh, back actually. Um, they, well, Gerald Ford was actually the fellow that took over as vice president, but there was also, um, it was very important to get, I, I, there's no doubt that, that Nixon would have done what Carter was going to, what Carter ended up doing, but what Kissinger wanted to do was to use sort of a velvet, not a, a velvet glove to sort of get the Chinese to cooperate and saying, we won't, um, we won't be in the same missile league with the Soviet Union, we can discuss strategic arms limitation with America before certainly, um, before certainly Moscow and Brezhnev does, um, and, but at the same time we'll tack on some economic relations. Does that answer your question? So, but, so Kissinger, Kissinger used strategic relations with interest in some small coaxing some, inter, some economic talk as well. I have a question. Uh, the big issue with China is the South China Sea and international trade and Taiwan, uh, which are very, very different from soft power. Uh, we saw a picture of the military exercises that India and Australia and the United States put together. And I wonder if you could comment on how, how China views this alliance r relative to their idea that they might invade Taiwan or they might control? Well, China, Beijing has made it very clear, we don't like those, we don't like those, 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 um, we don't like those, um, those Aussies in America, we don't like, we don't like their presence near Taiwan because of the fact that uh, we want to eventually, we want to try to coax, we want to try to entice Taiwan with ways, uh, with, with hopefully some economic ways, um, some economic, uh, economic relations and um, so forth to um, bring Taiwan under the rule of the PRC. Uh, fortunately, I don't believe Taiwan uh, is going to buy it by any stretch of the matter because of all the super protection they've had since the days of Harry Truman. And uh, Taiwan is also one of the Asian um, superpower um, super tigers, Asian tiger. Uh, it's the computer chip capital of the world. So. Um, they don't, I mean, China does not like, one of the things that greatly upsets China about the Quad is the presence of America, of the US, Aussie, Australian, and uh, the Quad Alliance naval forces being near, uh, being near Taiwan, so they don't like it at all. Uh, but they also need to respect the fact China does that um, not only does America have an alliance to help to protect Taiwan, the Taiwanese people have made it very, very clear that they, uh, that they want to be economically and, and, and militarily connected as well as protected by the United States of America. And um, at the same time, um, it, it would, it, 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 any sort of aggression on behalf of, uh, of China would certainly lead to um, certainly danger in Taiwan. Uh, the, I, uh, danger in Taiwan, and, uh, which, is, which is unfortunate because of the fact that well, for all reasons, but the, the People's Republic of China needs the Taiwanese economy as well because of the fact that um, the Taiwanese manufacture a lot of China, um, make jewelry from Chinese pearls and sell them back to China as well, which is interesting. That's a secret you don't hear very much about, but the, the, the pearl jewelry industry in the People's Republic of China is kept alive by Taipei. So does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Very good. Sir William, what about um, Hong Kong? Okay, Hong Kong, here we go. Uh, here we go, the old, the, old, uh, the, the island that Britain bought with opium, but anyhow. Um, well, with Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong, the, the students have made it very clear by their protests, sitting in the streets and the airports, and doing it right at the height of COVID, right at the beginning of COVID, that they want to keep a two-system, one-party, uh, a, a, two, a one-country, two-systems form of government, hopefully longer than 50 years, uh, which should be a no-brainer, as one might, should be obvious that it's something they'd want to keep. And there's no doubt that uh, Hong Kong is going to be more and more of a, of, of a, 
of a, of a Quad Alliance concern as Taiwan is. Um, if we continue to have unrest, unrest in Hong Kong, um, we have to keep in mind that 24% of our global economy, 24% of our global economy is based in Hong Kong. Oh my God. Yes, no, no, it's true. 24% of the global of, glo of the global economy is based in Hong Kong in terms of manufacturing. It's, the, it, 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 it's basically the Istanbul of the Eastern world, or what Istanbul used to be prior to the, the European, the Dutch, uh, the tulip, Dutch tulip takeover, as it was called in the 1600s. And so I, uh, if, 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 if uh, something were to happen to Hong Kong politically and economically, it, the, whole, the entire global community, no doubt, would want to come down and, and we would end up probably having a, um, a, tetrarch, uh, a, a tetrarch alliance maybe instead of a quad. In fact, there's already talk of South Korea, uh, as, as was mentioned in Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister Rudd's, um, Prime Minister Rudd's um, article. How do you see this, the new Russian and Chinese agreement, the treaty that they have signed? How is that affecting the balance of power? I'm sorry, I took the mic away. I mean, for example, I was thinking of what Russia today is doing in Ukraine, and how does that, ref would that be reflected in China and Taiwan? Well, um, the, what's, first of all, militarily, there is no military alliance, just to say very quickly, between uh, China and Russia. But nonetheless, they are the two most balance of power forces in that part of the world, as we obviously know. Um, what, would, um, what would greatly, ha well, uh, uh, they, he's called President Xi, but he's actually Premier Xi, um, has actually said, um, uh, Xi Jinping has actually said after meeting with, with Putin that it would, um, you know, it would not be wise for, you know, even if there was, uh, there was Russian victory in the Ukraine, um, of having any, or it, it would not be, it would certainly endanger, um, it, would, it, would, it would cause more and more people to, it, it would cause, with China, um, very, 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 very serious concern um, about people wanting to get aggressive towards China. Now, China and um, Russia are not military partners, but let's also remember that there was a terrible conflict uh, where um, four Chinese soldiers were killed and 20 Indian soldiers were killed on the India-China border less than two years ago. And um, the, um, it, they, it, it would be bad enough. Uh, th there would certainly be some, uh, possibly some dispute, um, you know, if Russia is going to take over the Ukraine and so forth, um, then there would be certainly, even if Russia wouldn't do anything to China, which we know of no evidence it plans to, um, it would cause uh, just the fact that there's a war in that part of the world would um, would, would would cause um, would cause China to get upset because then the Quad Alliance would widen and probably send most likely send more ships up to Vladivostok and uh, Sakhalin Island, the Russian islands north of Japan, and so the Quad Alliance would end up. Um, encircling all of China and by going up to northeastern Russia to, to go after Vladivostok or, or at least put a, put a presence at Vladivostok and the Sakhalin Islands of Russia. And um, that also uh, makes, uh, makes one wonder, you know, would, uh, would Canada also feel the need to get involved? Because they were, Canada played a tremendous role in keeping the, the Royal Canadian Navy was sent from British Columbia mm -hmm. Uh, straight to Korea in 1950 to hold down um, Pohang Harbor. Uh, th th they were the first Navy to actually get to Pohang Harbor in South Korea for the Allied troops to land and go into Incheon. So, and, then, and then, of course, North Korea uh, would be very uneasy with the Quad uh, being all the way up towards Russia. So we can't forget how, how violent tempered North Korea would get. Yeah, like dominoes. Yeah. It, would, it would be dominoes. Is that... Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, is there is there a little more that you would like to know? Because I'm, I'm just, I just, well, I, I've, I just wondered too. You made the comment about uh, Friedman. Uh, you made the comment about Friedman and his, and the bank and what they did to what it did to the Soviet Union was yeah. basically cause it to split up into the various nations that uh, that surround it now. Commonwealth of Nations, as it was called. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, Sir William, let me ask the question that's on everybody's mind. Um, economic sanctions. What does, what levers does Biden have at his disposal to lay on the Soviets for the incursion or the, the um, accessing of those two Russian-speaking nations? Well, he, he I, Putin has made it very, very clear that he's not that intimidated by any American sanctions, not that that puts him in the right, necessarily, not saying that. Um, but here is what's, um, what's very, very important. Putin could also say, well, China, um, you have a bit of an economic recession going on right now. Perhaps we could form 100% free trade with each other and get a military alliance together after all, um, possibly. I mean, let's hope that it doesn't go to that extreme. But economic sanctions haven't really seemed to, um, haven't seemed to intimidate Putin very much. And so Biden could do that. But it, 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 it was just a shame, going back to the 1990s, that there couldn't have been some soft power economic alliance between America and Russia. Not that there still wouldn't be some tensions, but um, and, and certainly a better job could have been done opening free trade relations with China. With, instead of just saying, here, China, here you go, China, let's be friends, let's trade, here's most of our manufacturing, without thinking about the, without thinking about the competitive edge. We could have used that philosophy with China, but first used it with Russia. I mean, I was last in Russia in 2005, and I mean, the, the, the poverty I saw in Moscow, the poverty I saw in Moscow, and to see young ladies and older women um, sitting, uh, sitting in hotel rooms in the evening, not, not that they were hosting the bridge club either. Uh, as you understand, uh, it, it, it just it was pathetic. I, it, it, I mean, and there was so much opportunity in the early 1990s to have, got, to have opened up some economic, some soft power economic alliance with Russia to help improve the country economically and so forth. Russia has the largest gas reserves of, gas res, oil reserves, uh, gas reserves of any oil reserves of any nation in the world. And we look at all, of course, it was done with slave labor, but. Um, Look at all of the five-year plans that Joseph Stalin came up with in the late 1920s, early 1930s. Think of the positive, the positive five-year plans that we, as the Western world, could have come up with in the early 1990s to have helped Russia. If we had done something to help Russia economically, um, and, and by helping Russia create a mixed economy, one that had a, a free market capitalist base, but one in which we had companies and the governments of all of, our, of the countries working together, giving each other incentive money. I do believe that Russia would be far more contented, perhaps, certainly economically, than it is. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, uh, of course, I've been kind of riveted to my TV recently, so I've been watching all this. Mm -hmm. But I know that China has invested a lot into Ukraine. I mean, they were talking about the fact that in, in the hotels in Lviv, it's Chinese and Chinese. They have a lot yeah. of tourism. They have a lot well, of trade back and forth. Yeah, well, uh, number one, yeah. and then I, I, I have a feeling that now maybe you would say if we had done the soft power stuff back in the 1990s, maybe we wouldn't have like a Putin in power. But I'm not sure that would be actually real. But with Putin, the way he, he appears to be and his being so in love with the prior Soviet empire, he kind of, he kind of, to me, I get, when you do the soft power thing with him, I think he thinks it's a sign of weakness. Well, with Russia, again, as mentioned at the end, and that's not an unfair point, I did mention very briefly in my closing comments, Russia's a different story. Um, um, but I do think that when the transition period was going on in the early 1990s with Boris Yeltsin, the vodka king, uh, and so forth, uh, there, there would have been a possibility that economically and politically we might have ended up economically, there would have also been, um, there would have been soft economic power would have made things even better politically because as many people will tell you in Russia, well, the only reason we voted for Putin, my tour guide told me, is because is it was either him or go back to the Soviet regime. Yeah, so I, and so I completely agree with, with what you've said. I mean, the man is obviously, uh, is obviously a bully. Uh, we, we can't deny that uh, by any stretch of the matter. You're absolutely right. 
But before we knew much or anything about Putin, when we had the quiet coup of August of 1991, where the Duma was shut down quietly, and here comes uh, Boris Yeltsin down um, Arbat Street, near Arbat Street on the tank and so forth. Well, uh, we just, the, the economically, um, economically, there was so much that could have been done to, I dare say, have made a better political, because if, if the economy had been doing better, then the, you would have had a growing middle class, you would have had many people saying, well, let's, um, we want this kind of party, we want that sort of party, not just, uh, not just Putin. Um, that doesn't mean he would not have appeared still, wouldn't have gone away, but um, the economic, if, if there had been some economic efforts made during, the, again, the, the silent coup transition period, things might have been a little different. Yes, ma'am. Technology with technology, the technology efforts in China, in terms of the impact on our country, because we initially we trained a lot of those tech people in this country at universities. And I, do you have any ideas about what is this good or bad? Well, um, it could definitely be a bad thing. Uh, they could use it against America, um, use it against us if uh, if they if the Quad Alliance continues to grow, which we've no doubt it shall. And um, well, I think already North Korea did that a little bit a few summers ago, uh, when we had uh, back in the, the summer of 2015. Well, I say a few summers ago, it was seven years ago. Um, it was interesting. We had that situation where there was suddenly there were blinks on the internet. The internet would go off and it would come back on. And I can remember one of my students saying, "It must be the North Koreans." And so I, you know, if. <laughs> If the North Koreans have actually been able to, non, no doubt, um, have information, possibly from some friends in Beijing, I have no doubt it could be used. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, I, I think very. that's a Yes, ma'am, very, by all means. Final question, mm -hmm. crystal ball. What do you see coming up in terms of the Russian-Ukraine situation? With well, to be perfectly honest, um, if, there is continued NATO presence in the Ukraine, which I dare say the Ukrainian people should have a right to have. Uh, there's going to be an invasion, or, or it's going to come awfully close, um, to be perfectly fair, because Putin has made it very clear, just paraphrasing what he has said, I do not want uh, NATO American-style missiles pointed at my country, and if it happens, I'm going to invade. I do not want to invade. And so what, what needs to be seen, and, and yet the Ukraine is not officially a member of NATO. They've been, they've, they've been running, they've been, it's been an ongoing go now for 30 years, since 1992. Um, so what, um, what would be lovely is if, well, I say lovely, but uh, what, what, would be, what might be a possibility is if there could be some sort of, some sort of compromise between President Biden and Putin to say, well, let's have NATO in the western and central part of the Ukraine with a large reduction of missiles, but not in the eastern part of the Ukraine, which is very pro-Russian, or uh, let, that, uh, if, let free elections be held in the eastern part of the Ukraine if the people of the eastern part of the Ukraine want free elections, and if they would like to become an autonomous republic, such as the um, Dohetsk Republic, a very small Republic on the border between Russia and the Ukraine. Um, if you'd like, if they would like to become um, a, an independent, uh, Eastern Ukraine would like to become an independent republic, or even a part of Russia, but most preferably, an independent Eastern Ukraine that has strategic protection from Russia, and Russia in turn would feel comfortable having the Eastern Ukraine, which is very pro-Russian in its backyard, with no NATO missiles. That might be a better port in the storm. Yes, and that's exactly, yeah, with Belarus. I do hope that answers. Anyone else? I hope that answered the question. Please, let's give a round of applause to Sir William. Thank you all very much. Thank you.